For the second time in two years, a new face will be representing Hawaii in the U.S. House as Kai Kahele vacates his position. The Congressional District 2 seat covers all neighbor islands and rural Oahu. Three candidates will be on the November general election ballot. Hear their stance on the issues as they fight for your vote to send them to our nation's capital. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. After serving one term in Congress, Hawaii Representative Kai Kahele chose not to run for re-election as he made an unsuccessful bid for governor. Now two women and one man are looking to fill the vacancy in Washington, D.C. The U.S. House District 2 seat represents rural Oahu and the neighbor islands. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call in your questions and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Libertarian Michelle Tippins resides on Hawaii Island after moving here nearly a decade ago. She has a master's degree in criminal justice and served as a counterintelligence agent in the U.S. Army. She's also the executive director of the Hawaii Veterans Cannabis Alliance. Democrat Jill Takuda is a graduate of Castle High School and has a bachelor's degree in international relations. For 12 years, she served in the state Senate representing Kaneohe and Kailua. The mom of two is also a small business owner of a consulting practice. Practice. And Republican Joe Akana is a Kamehameha Schools graduate and holds two master's degrees in business administration and strategic intelligence. He's a retired project manager and analyst with the U.S. government and served in the U.S. Air Force as an intelligence analyst. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's so great to see all three of you. Uh, Joe, I want to start with you and, and we'll go around the table, but what local issues are you hoping to fix and address at the national level? Well, I think the biggest issue we can look at and confront is the cost of living in, in the state of Hawaii. Our, our people are suffering. Um, I was just watching something where the city estimated inflation rate is somewhere around 12 plus percent and that's conservative. But our people here in the state of Hawaii are suffering and I think we, we need to come up with programs that are going to address these issues. One of the things we hear talking about and I've heard many people talk as we go around the state is the, they talk about the GET issue why they have to keep paying more and more taxes. The taxes should keep rising. Our cost of living keeps going up, but what are we doing about it? What are our leaders doing about it? And that's an issue that I don't think has been really addressed. We continue to look at it um, and it's not going anywhere. It just keeps going higher and higher. Our cost of living goes higher and higher. I'd like um, to address that with you. Yeah, you go ahead. Chance. So what we find, um, the Libertarian Party is all about like fiscal, moral, medical freedoms, right? So what we look at in the private sector is that they are geared towards maximizing the productivity of labor, right? Making sure that we get the most bang for our buck when we're doing production of goods and services. The public sector doesn't really have that same driving need. And so what we really need to do is turn this back over to the private sec sector, let them maximize the productivity of labor again, and that will bring, the, you know, bring our standard of living back up and help that cost of living come back down because our money will go farther with that increased productivity. So that's what I'd like to see is some programs that really start to push the private sector back up again and help them because just increasing, increasing the money by inflation or increasing the minimum wage, it's gonna increase the cost of running business for our business and then they have to pass right. that expense on, right? So that's why our cost of living is going up. So what do you think? You know, and hopefully, Joe, you were able to, to finish your thought on there, but just want to say I do appreciate his comments about, you know, the fact that as we go throughout the state and we have, to me, it's a real honor for us to be able to go into literally every community across our islands and be able to sit and listen and, and hear what people's hopes are, but also the frustrations they feel. And as I've really done that, especially when we focus on our most rural communities here on Oahu and throughout the neighbor islands, it comes down to me to an issue of access access to the most basic things that people feel they need to see a future for them see her in the state. Access to healthcare and mental health services. 
access to housing people can afford. We're talking young families, you know, workers just coming to the workforce, to seniors who would need a little bit more assistance and education and workforce opportunities to get those jobs that can really help them to just make it here in Hawaii. Right. The reality is without equal access, and equal access does not exist here in Hawaii. It depends on what zip code you live in. It depends on the island. Without access to these most basic things, health care, housing, education, and workforce opportunities, our greatest export is going to continue to be our children and our families. And I can tell you as a mother of two, I sit down at that kitchen table every night and I look across at them and I question and I wonder, will they be able to stay here in Hawaii? Right. Will they see a future for themselves here? And I would guess even just going around these tables here, we know far too many people that have picked up and left in the last 12 months and not by choice, right. but we felt they just couldn't make it. And that's the struggle and that's the fight and urgency we've got to take to Washington. So do you agree with Joe that, that affordability is the number one issue? Affordability, but really too, when we talk about what it takes to make a life here, it really comes down to making sure that we can take care of ourselves. And especially as I've crossed these islands, we have healthcare deserts, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm sure Michelle's experienced it yeah. right there on and Hawaii. Yeah, we have, I mean, even accessibility to water. So we're talking about most basic. Mm -hmm. I, I'm from an area where we've had lava flows in the last five years. Um, and unfortunately, Puna has had to sacrifice some of their social and community safety for geothermal exploration that's becoming more and more like fracking is kind of getting dangerous for us over there. And so a lot of our places, there's no water coming in. There's no sewage going out. There's no, there's no basic, basic, you know, forget education and a doctor. We want water. Um, veterinary care, you know, that's another major issue that sometimes just kind of slips under the, under the radar. But, you know, on Big Island, people have herd animals, livestock animals, to help them sustain their life, right? We have a food desert on Big Island. We know that already. We're giving out micro grants to help fix that. And basic veterinary care is, is also really hard to find. And the legislature's doing a great job. I've seen that that's happening where now veterinarians and doctors can come and get a provisional operation license for 30 days. So maybe us gearing some of our monies, grant money into private sectors that are having these like visiting Doctors Without Borders, Veterinarians Without Borders kind of environments, we can make those improvements at the state level. We can funnel, funnel you know, the federal grant money into that and actually get some real correction to the problem because Joe sees it too. I know Joe sees yeah. it. Joe's been out to Big Island. I've seen him. You know, what's, what's interesting though is, is one of the, the subjects Joe talked on was about our senior care and our senior mm -hmm. folks. You know, I've, I've served in multiple food distribution lines. I did a, a lot of servicing at the Lanakila Meals on Wheels, delivering food to seniors and stuff. And what, it was shocked me as we sat in the line one day, we were actually looking at this and 95% of the people that came through the line were seniors in Kapuna. I was like, really, I could not believe that. And then you see something like what I just saw it today where the uh, Social Security Administration said they're gonna bump that up eight point seven percent it's like hundred and forty dollars per senior and yet the inflation rate is higher than the rate they're getting so are they really going to be helping any more or are they going to just continue to fall further and further behind yeah, that page. right and, and and according to kaiser i think they said that 15 million seniors today age 65 plus are economically insecure well mm -hmm. on that point i mean right. what do you think is a way to shore up that program we know so many seniors in hawaii uh, rely on social security and i think that that bump that you mentioned today it's significant it's yeah. welcome news yeah. for them yeah but what do you think bigger. on the national level can be done to shore up that program well, I, I, you know, it's funny. I had a study done when I was um, doing my master's degree in D.C. back in 2014. And one thing we were looking at was a program called Sovereign Wealth Funds. And it essentially, it allows the state or the government, the country, to in make investments into other areas. When we first looked at and inquired into this, China had two of them. And this was in 2014. Each one of those were, at that time were valued at over $2 trillion a piece. And their whole purpose was to help seniors as they got older to be able to live better lives, to be able to fund those types of programs. Um, it was insane when you start to look at that. I seen uh, someone, even Harvard Business School has their own sovereign wealth fund. Nigeria has their own sovereign wealth fund. Why don't we have that or be able to take advantage of that when we can do exactly the same type of things? 
Jill, what do you think about Social Security and the major boost that that program and that a lot of seniors are getting today? You know, I think the real benefit to the boost that we saw in Social Security, something that hasn't taken place for decades, is that it was coupled with a reduction in Medicare Part B premiums as well. Really, again, to try to make sure that seniors can get the maximum benefit from this increase. But I will say this, that entitlement programs alone cannot support our aging community, mm -hmm. especially one that wants to age in place. And so going back to housing people can afford at that point in time in life when they need it. You know, I look at Halemakua on Maui, for example, and the affordable senior living setup that they have there. It's a community where people can afford to live in these units and be able to be surrounded by other seniors and retirees in close access to healthcare, to, you know, um, you know, social services, to food markets, all of these different things. We've got to do better in terms of tapping into those federal resources that would allow us to increase the number of units available for our seniors to be able to live in a place that really respects the kind of community that they want to engage in, but give them access to the services that we need as we age. I think that's so important. You know, I want to go back to the, the you know, farming issues mm -hmm. and the animal husbandry and veterinary needs that we have. We're in a prime opportunity in less than 12 months to be able to make sure Hawaii is on the map with that. The Farm Bill reauthorization comes up in 2023. And to me, it's been a long time since we've had someone on the Agriculture Committee. We've got to make sure that they know that Unlike the Midwest, we've got very unique mm -hmm. food development, food production needs, both from growing crops to sustaining proteins as right. well. And so we've got to make sure that within any reauthorization of any bill, we're recognized for those unique needs and we get the support and resources. Mm -hmm. In some cases, we get the latitude that we need to be able to feed ourselves and thrive as an industry. Yeah. So we definitely want to focus on that. I want to ask you about the dynamic in Congress because we see, you know, a lot of lawmakers go to Washington with great intentions and then the reality of the political divisiveness means that a lot of stuff doesn't get done. Particularly in your case, if you were to be elected, my understanding is that you would be the only libertarian. I would be the one drop of red ink in that glass of water. <laughs> right. Yes, so, I would. Yes, so I would. So given that, how would you work with colleagues from the other sides of the party and would you align yourself more? you know, with the Democrats or the Republicans. I recognize that you're a, a libertarian. That's complicated to go ahead. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but um, tell us how you would navigate that. All right, so, I mean, one of the primary things that I should mention is which means I speak Arabic. And so when it comes to foreign affairs, I'm gonna have the background of not just the culture, but, you know, different expectations and customs that we see in Middle Eastern um, affairs. And so, you know, the military gave me that kind of background so that I understand what we're dealing with. And what that turns into is that Hawaii's legislator is now an asset to not just that committee, but the whole legislature. So now we're gonna have Democrats and Republicans able to lean on Hawaii for help with what are we gonna do about this or where is this coming from or what do you think that this is gonna turn out like because I can watch the news in Arabic and just kind of take the temperature, right? Um, I'm sure that would take me a little bit more practice than I'm used to, but um, I was at a point of fluency to travel to the country and, and I have done that, traveled and spoken with natives. So um, having that ability to bridge that gap by just being like, hey, I can help you with this um, is really valuable. And then what I personally have found, so I was raised in Texas, which is very Republican, and obviously emigrated, if you will, to Hawaii because this kind of lines more up with where I'm at socially. And when I got here, somebody said, well, you don't really feel Republican, you feel libertarian. And then I looked into it and found that, you know, Democrats who start a small business and Republicans who smoke weed are pretty much all libertarians. <laughs> and so having this balance of both parties' interests and ideals is really kind of where I fit in, where I'm just looking for the lowest common denominator legislation, which basically means I see the intent of our founders as being let the people make their own decisions as much as possible in their own lives. And so what I'm looking for is legislation that's going to minimize people's restrictions and allow people to have that trust back from their government again to make their own decisions in their own personal life. And so that's really where I think I'll find the balance. Joe, today we saw those January 6th hearings and mm -hmm. you know partisanship is never hotter than at this moment, I would say. How would you navigate the complexities of Washington and trying to get something done for Hawaii given how divided their government is right now? Yeah, I think the most important thing that, that's missing in, our, uh, in a lot of the things, the discussions we have today 
is the human element. Somewhere along the way, we have forgotten that we're all part of the same race. We're part of the same people, Routine. right? We're, part, we, we're, I mean, you, we're all, other than you guys being ladies, right? I mean, we're the same, right? We have blood running through us, we are our bodies, and, we, and, and people are forgetting this, that, oh, that was my friend yesterday, but because you don't agree with the way I think today, I can't talk to you anymore. And you see that on the social media type of, of apparatuses where, oh, I'm not friending you. Oh, okay, Blocking. why? I'm blocking you because I don't like you anymore. Well, you liked me yesterday, but you don't like me today. I mean, finding that common ground is what we got to remember. I've talked to people that say, oh, well, what do you think about racism as an issue? Since that seems to be a major divider. And I'm saying, it's like this. I'm not a racist. And they go, you're not a racist. I say, no. Define for me what racism is. And after they said everything they said, it really comes down to being an ethnic prejudice against one particular person or another. It's not about you being a racist because of your skin color. It's you because you don't like someone because they're from a particular area or a junior. I said, so if you really want to define it that way, define it as an ethnic prejudice, not as a racism, but that's just one aspect, right? But we got to avoid this divisive language between people and let, let's, let's talk. Let's sit down and have a discussion. And in, in Hawaiian, we call it the ho'oponopono, right? You sit down and you talk. You have a cup of coffee, you share some food and you talk. How can we overcome issues? Do we just continue to kick the, kick the issues down the road or do we face the issues and start having those discussions, right? Because if we don't, then what have we got left? What are your thoughts on this, given the partisan divide that we see in Washington and how we can try to make sure that our lawmakers are indeed productive? Yeah, no, I think at the end of the day, right, we all have to just remember it's not about us. Mm -hmm. It's not about our parties. It's about the people that we serve. It's about this country, yeah. what we've always wanted for it, what our forefathers wanted for it, and how we're going to be a part yeah. of the action and the change that gets us there. And I agree, we've forgotten the human element of it. You know, take a look at this room right here. This is not a new situation for me, serving 12 years in the Senate or running a business, to sit alongside folks that we will disagree on a number of policy issues. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we need to sit together, facing each other, and work things through. That's leadership. That's what we need right now in D.C., folks that are going to understand that it's about something so much bigger than ourselves, and it is about restoring that trust and confidence people have in government. Because as a result of January 6th and so much of what we've seen, it's at historic low. Trust, faith, confidence in government, and it's every one of our responsibilities to not just focus on rebuilding it. We've got to earn that back. And the only way we earn that back is through actions, and that's really what we've got to do. One of the areas of policy that, I'm, that I suspect you will disagree on is abortion. We know that Congress will likely take this up and uh, depending on who's in charge, may try to uh, shore up some protections for women and reproductive rights. The governor here in Hawaii, of course, passed an executive order to do just that, to protect uh, doctors and medical information from outside, uh, you know, other states. Um, where do you stand on that and what do you think should be done at the federal level when it comes to the right to choose? You know, I think I've been very, very solidly clear in my staunch support for abortion, for Roe v. Wade, and for a woman's right to make decisions about her body and access to reproductive health care not being a barrier in any state where someone may live. And so uh, definitely this is a personal and a strong issue. I look at my nieces and I, I cry at the fact that they will have less rights than their grandmother did, than my mother did. That's unacceptable to me. And I look at our state, and especially I look at CD2. When we talk about access, the reality is what island you live on, you don't even have access to reproductive health mm -hmm. services right now, let alone an abortion, which everyone should have access to, whether it be through the pills and Plan B, whether it be through emergency contraception you can get. The federal level, we have to make sure that there are no barriers. Right now, when we look at the map of our country, it's a checkerboard of where women have rights and where they do not. And it's our responsibility as women, as leaders, as people who believe in human rights, to make sure that that map is clear. It's about a woman's right to choose and make choices about her body, and even here in Hawaii, make sure that there are no barriers, depending on where you live, to reproductive health care and access to abortions. Michelle, what's your take? Oh, I love that the girls get to weigh on in this. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it comes back to what I said a moment before, which is that least common denominator uh, legislation where I, I trust our, our voters and, our, and the women that are in these positions to know the variables that they are dealing with and to make the hardest decision. This is, this is harder than making a cancer treatment decision. This is the hardest decision of your life because 
a woman recognizes it's not just her life that's involved in that decision. So to treat it like it's not, to treat it like it's being taken flippantly by the women who make those decisions is, is terrible in my mind. But um, I, th I think that when we take away the right to have an abortion, you're not taking away people having an abortion. You're taking away people's ability to receive safe and effective medical treatment. And so I'm sure all of us saw Dirty Dancing back in the day. It was my grandma's favorite movie. And that girl almost died because she couldn't get a legal access to a medical treatment option. So um, it's really for me as a libertarian about recognizing that people have moral, medical, and financial sovereignty to make their own decisions. Everyone here is an adult, and I think we can all tr treat each other with that trust and respect that you can make your own decision. Joe, Lindsey Graham has suggested there should be a federal 15-week ban uh, on abortion. Do you agree with that policy? What's your stance on this? Oh, a federal 15-week ban, I'm, I'm not that sure. That you wouldn't be allowed to have an abortion anywhere in the United States after 15 weeks. Again, right. I, I'm gonna reiterate what both of them just said. I, I believe that it's a woman's choice to do this. I am gonna, however, car um, paraphrase that a little bit. When the overturning of Roe versus Wade, people need to understand what that legislation did. And all it did was take the issue from the federal government and returned it back to the states. It gave the states the power to do what they were just, what they were just describing. It's in the power to do that. The, the governor just passed that bill. He said, this is, we're gonna sign an executive order authorizing that. The real issue about this whole thing is the funding issue. And we gotta remember, in my, my line of work, previous life as an intelligence officer, we were, it was always follow the money. If you wanna look at what happened, follow the money. There was $270 million that were authorized, I believe in the last budget, for um, agencies such as Planned Parenthood, that they were able to do whatever they're doing. Again, I'm not saying it's not a woman's right to do that. You wanna do it, your body, your choice, fine, perfect. The difference is I or any other taxpayer don't have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have to pay for those objects, those things that you're doing. And here, let me, let me try to give you a little bit of, of idea on the stats on this. In 2018, Florida performed over 70,000 abortions. 303 of those were due to incest, rape, or um, endangerment to the mother or the child. That's like a 0.004% of the amount, which means the other 69,000 were because of birth control. I'll talk about right? that. Secondly on this is that if we take it down to the state of Hawaii, what does this mean? In 2020, we had 1,809 abortions performed in the state. To give you a picture, that was the entire high school in 2022 of Waianae, from freshman to the senior class. The entire high school, that's what that represented. It was the entire high school for Lelihua High School, the entire high school for Roosevelt. So if you start to get an image of what 1,809 abortions is, that's the picture that you look at, right? That's what you're gonna be seeing. The, the biggest issue, again, is that, I'm gonna say, if you just follow the money, that's where it's gonna come down to. If in case people don't know, agencies such as Planned Parenthood, right, not only do they perform those, and they know they do, do other things too, but they also sell the body parts of the fetuses that are in play. It's all over, I've seen it. I've seen places where kids are being sold. I've seen videos on it and it's, it's, it's enough to make you cry. I'm, I'm yeah, I, I mean, I have, to, I have to jump in and dispute that. They're not here to defend themselves, so I, I, I don't really no, I'm not. go down that road. Right. If I could just, you know, kind of add to that, you know, comment about follow the money yeah. and the money that Planned Parenthood and other organizations get to mm -hmm. be able to provide access to basic health care, women's health care and reproductive care that they need. The reality is that so many right now are restricted by income. We're talking mm -hmm. of women of color. We're talking of women that are in socioeconomically depressed communities. We're talking about a lot of the women here in Hawaii. A lot of the relatives that many of us have across this mm -hmm. country. Access is limited by those who have the ability to pay. And those situations you talked about, whether it be rape, incest, and so many other situations, disproportionately women of color, marginalized, vulnerable women, 
are in that population, taking away that money restricts their ability to have what Michelle was talking about in terms of having, you know, the moral, I think you talked about it, the moral, medical, and, medical financial. and financial, you know, sovereignty, the ability to choose. So I disagree on the money part. I see where you're going with this trail that we should cut public funding to make sure basic access to But the state reproductive is already health. doing that. The state has already said they would be funding that. The governor but already the said, which is exactly what they critical, were supposed to do. Critical. When you take a look across the country, when you take a look at Hawaii, those federal dollars to make sure, and this is not just abortion services. This is ovarian screening, cancer screenings. This is taking a look at emergency contraception. This is birth control. A lot of women, a lot of young girls don't have access to this right now. And I think we should be looking at increasing access, especially in rural communities that tend to be populated by women of color more than not. We have a lot of struggling communities throughout Congressional District 2. For me, it's a plus game in here. We cannot do enough to support the women and girls in our community who rely on these basic reproductive health services. It's life-saving in many cases, especially when you look at cancer screenings, when you look at breast exams, all the different things that these organizations like Planned Parenthood well, provide. The, let's, There's, let's move oh. to some viewer questions because that's also what makes this forum so unique. Jacob on Facebook says, what do the candidates think about campaign finance reform? Let's start with you. Oh, I am 100% for campaign finance reform. We are actually, as a party, um, working towards making some changes with campaign finance right now with um, the um, election commission. What we're looking at currently is that the, um, right now we have things like standards for, if you donate more than $100 to a political campaign, then you have to give a whole bunch of your information. And that standard was set because when people give a lot of money, we wanna know that they're giving a lot of money. We kinda wanna have an idea about that. That's transparency, right? But those numbers were set back in the 80s. And so $100, I mean, that's not even an oil change anymore. So donating an oil change to somebody's campaign really is kind of wasteful to have to get all this extra information when that's really a flippant amount of money in today's econo uh, economic state. Um, in addition to that, um, they don't have any um, statute of limitation for um, if you've had an issue with filing forms and stuff before. and. While I recognize that forms and transparency are, uh, transparency are vital, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling a little. Um, when there's so much going on that people are no longer willing to run for an office and represent their community because they don't want to deal with hundreds of filings, it gets prohibitive to the process. Joe, what's your take on campaign finance reform? What do you say to Jacob tonight? Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, when you look at the amount of donations that have been ex received by multiple candidates, some in the millions, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we basically run a grassroots campaign. Um, do we have millions and millions of dollars being donated? <laughs> no, that would be nice. Um, it would be nice. You, your campaign would change differently. But by updating or changing the campaign spending commission and make it so that you can only have a certain dollar amount. Mm -hmm. I mean, that'd be great. That would be awesome. Then at least you know it's an equal playing field. Right? Everybody can do the same thing. Then it becomes down to see who can spend their money the wisest, who does the best choices, how do we go about doing this, right? And that would be one thing. I'd be 100% behind campaign finance reform. What are your thoughts on this? You know, I've, um, I, I've been on the receiving end of a lot of dark money, literally millions of dark money that's come into this state as a result of super PAC independent expenditures, as we saw in the primary and previous races, just super PAC expenditures in the millions, literally. Um, and so yes, I completely believe and support what we've heard here that we need campaign finance reform. We've got to put people back at the center of these elections. Mm -hmm. And when you've got this amount of money coming in, in some cases, unlimited amounts of dark money mm -hmm. coming in with unknown intent and purpose into our state, that takes the power away from people. And we do have to make sure people know at the end of the day, it's about them. You know, we've got to end Citizens United. It's one of the reasons that when I entered this congressional race, we agreed not to take any corporate PAC money as well. When I ran for lieutenant governor previously, I committed to public financing. We've got to make that across the board on the state level to me, is really make sure that it is an even playing field that puts people back in power. And at the federal level, we've got to get rid of this dark money, this unlimited billions of dollars, literally, that we're seeing pouring through these races every single year, trying to buy our vote. Mm -hmm. We've got to do better, and the people deserve better.
Uh, this is a question directed specifically to you, and please do keep these questions coming in. We love to hear from you. Uh, it says, does Mr. Okana support Trump's claim that the election was stolen? Is he a Trump supporter? Uh, I'm sure you encounter this a lot. The the former president is the standard bearer of the party, and you know some people really love him, and others do not. What is your answer uh, to our caller today? Well, first of all, let me just put it this way: um, Is Donald Trump running for election in 2022? I don't think so. I think we are. And when you ask those questions, I've been asked this many times. My my biggest issue with this: I'm not an election denier. Somebody can say, You're, I've been told I was an election denier, and I'm not. The election occurred. Do I agree that there were some issues in there that could have been fixed, that could have been adjusted, updated, changed? Absolutely. You guys did an, PBS Insights did an interview with Scott Nago on November 6th of 2020. I think it was Mr. Huff that did the interview at that time. And he asked the question, that he knew, he said, how many ballots do you think were misformed, unformed? And he said there was a hundred, over 100,000 ballots that were either e sent to the wrong address or sent to dead people. 100,000 well, in Hawaii? That's what was on, Mr. Nago said that. I in think your we're going to have to insight. go back and check that tape. I find right? that very hard to believe. Well, that's what he Please said. Please go on. And the interviewer that was with him then said, oh, that's one-eighth of the registered voters. That's okay. It was like... I had thought, well, why wasn't a Freedom of Information Act request, a FOIA request submitted to actually get those records and look at it? When you say one in eight is okay to have, wow, that's a huge number. Would that have changed an election? I, Absolutely. I, I find it, well, let's, let's focus specifically. I, I, I think we have to go back and check that because that does not, those numbers don't sound right to me, but um, focusing on the viewer's question specifically, do you think that there was enough irregularity in the in the in Trump's election for the claim that he that it was stolen. You know, I I think there were a lot of irregularities that have not been clarified, not been transparent. Even though they're off, the election was certified, I still looked at all of the different things. I have seen so many videos of elections from different offices. I have seen people where they showed being blocked out of a. Uh, 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 of uh, poll rules. I have seen people being removed from poll booths. You've seen videos of things happening in the state of Georgia. I've, I've watched the numbers go backwards on my own eyes, on my own TV set, watching the election, watch the numbers go backwards, then go forward. They, how does that happen when you're doing that? So is there a lot of issues? Yeah, there are a lot of issues. There's a lot of trend, things that we could open up, have an election integrity? Absolutely. That should be on paramount on everyone's mind to have election integrity to restore those elections. Well, let's, I mean, let's move on to us because there are so many questions and so many issues facing the, you know, that, that this seat will have to deal with. Uh, I want to get to uh, the president recently pardoned those folks who have uh, criminal marijuana possession at the federal level. He's calling on governors to do the same. Governor Ige has not indicated whether or not he will do that. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, given your role, uh, you know, with we, we mentioned at the top that you yeah, are involved with yeah. veterans and, so, and supporting cannabis. So what are your thoughts? Should the U.S. government decriminalize marijuana? Absolutely, 100 um, percent. The Libertarian Party has been behind the decriminalization of marijuana for 50 years. So you know, it looks like we've been right all along and we kind of told you so, but, um, you know, me personally, uh, I've been a cannabis ad advocate for over 10 years. Uh, I have got really hurt in the military and that has done a lot for me to help with my PTSD and my injuries and pain. Um, and so when I moved to Hawaii in 2013, I kind of hit the r ground running as a cannabis advocate. And um, it doesn't surprise me that Governor Ige hasn't necessarily done any kind of pardon because, um, from what I understand from, you know, going to committee hearings and, and giving testimony, uh, from what I understand from the Hawaii Police Department, or sorry, the Honolulu Police Department, is that no one has been arrested and held for marijuana since, I think, Roger Christie. Um, and he was let go in, I think, 2015 and, and sent back to his home, and his wife did um, some probation and, and got to come home, too. So we might not have any marijuana criminals being charged and held in a federal, you know, level. Do you see what I'm saying? So, um, Governor Ige might not have anybody to pardon, but we're definitely behind the decriminalization of cannabis. 
Where do you stand on this? Do you agree with what the president did? I, I do agree. And, you know, I think it's um, important to be really clear, too, that the pardons were for misdemeanor offenses as well. And I think when we take a look at these particular types of offenses, again, mm -hmm. we've had some of these discussions. It's disproportionately persons of color mm -hmm. that we're seeing um, people in very low socioeconomic um, communities that I'm are more right likely impacted. So um, I do support the, the president's actions and, and quite frankly giving the states the ability to make those choices on, on their own as well. Where do you stand on this? Yeah, I think that makes a, a lot of sense. I mean, I have seen, I had a good friend of mine. He was, uh, he was suffering PTSD from the war. He was in, served four tours in um, Iraq, two in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And he came back, he was literally a mess without having a legalization of, of cannabis. He, he became a very different person with, without having something like to take care of that. So I think having what the president did, great job. Thank you for actually thinking about what would work for the people, right? Thank you, appreciate that. At least we know that where it's going, you know, makes some sense. Let's bring in another viewer question. We've talked a lot about uh, domestic affairs, but this is an international question, uh, and we'll start with you on this. What do you think should be done to deter North Korea's nuclear capabilities? We've seen a lot of news out of North Korea in the last week or so. Um, how do we address this? You know, I think first and foremost, all eyes are on what they do next, and also more importantly, um, how other countries react as well. You know, right now with the flyover, they're showing their capacity. We know they have nuclear armaments there. The question is, do they repeat 2017? In a few days, literally, you've got China's party congress coming up. And as we know, um, whether it's the party congress, whether it's the midterm elections, if North Korea decides to actually test their nuclear weapons here, my eyes actually are going to be on the response from China and Russia as well. The last time what we saw in 27 was swift. Um, swift responses from both of those countries as well, saying this is absolutely not acceptable. Unilateral sanctions, that has to continue again. If we see an easing back and an easing up on it, I think there's really great concerns uh, now about where the alliances are being drawn and the fact that we need to respond with swift sanctions. Um, we need to make sure that they know it's absolutely unacceptable um, to be doing this kind of behavior. Joe, what do you think should be done to deter nu North Korea's nuclear capabilities? Well, it's interesting, you know, being an intelligence analyst working for U.S. Pacific Command, this was brought to our attention many, many times. Um, fortunately, we had a shop that could produce a whole bunch of stuff and you would look through things, but <laughs> wonderful having staff that way. But with, the, with, with North Korea, we have to understand their mentality um, of where they're coming from. And I think the biggest issues they have is, in many cases, they're actually starving in food. Their food shortages are, we think we have it bad here in this case, they have it even worse. They have other shortages that we don't even have any idea what they're talking about, uh, what they're looking for, but they use the missile launches, they use the arms games, if you will, the nuclear threats as a way of getting foreign countries to capitulate to their wishes and their wants, that what we need is more food, what we need is more X, Y, or Z. And they use those forums, they use the nuclear armaments in order to get what they need. We have to continue to act as a deterrent to them. We have to have a strong deterrent in what we're doing against their motives or against their issues, right? And if we can work through that with a trade agreement, why not? Why couldn't we help it? If it helps them to get rid of their big issues, they've got to feed their people just like everyone else. Michelle? I, I actually am really glad that Joe got to right at the end. I was like, say trade, say trade. So. You know, as a Buddhist, I recognize that I can't control the world, I can control me. And we have to do that as well, right? We have to control how the United States spends United States dollars. And we have to decide who we're gonna trade with and we're gonna have to decide. So stopping, st stop giving China and, and Korea and everyone, stop giving all these guys the stuff they need to make what they're making. You know, stop, stop trading uranium, you know, and, and trade food trade medical supplies and make sure that these people are, and, and maybe this is a solution where Doctors Without Borders can come in again and we can have this basic needs help that the people need in these communities without sending just money to continue to fuel the monster. It's, it's like, um, you know, it breaks my heart when I hear, you know, armaments and money going to Ukraine that's not gonna stop a war. Sending more weapons doesn't stop war. Uh, Joe and I have seen how weapons get used. They don't get used for peace, they're, they're destruction. So um, 
What I'd really like to see as far as solving these kinds of problems is identifying the issues through trade sanctions and through trade agreements so that we're no longer putting money in the wrong places. Well, let's talk about the military here at home. There's a question just about that. Should the presence of the U.S. military in Hawaii change? Yes. In what way? Yes. Um, so I think that the forces need to be reduced. I think that we don't need so many people here. And, and there's this concept that it's good for the economy, but it's not because when a veteran or, well, they're not veterans when they get here. When an active duty service member comes to Hawaii, they see this ridiculous cost of living that we get from the Jones Act restricting our shipping and making everything 30% more expensive. And they spend their dollars on the base, don't they, Joe? Yep. They spend their dollars in the commissary, which is a grocery store. They spend their dollars in the, in the exchange, which is a giant mall, basically. So those military dollars don't really come to the community the way that we have been told that they do, right? Because they spend that money on those bases and those, those AFES, which is Army and Air Force Exchange Services, those, that money goes right back to the mainland. It goes right back to the continent. So um, I wanna see a reduction in forces. Uh, as a libertarian, I am very staunch that we should have a strong defensive force, but that our Department of Defense should be about defense and not about offense. So um, that also, brings a reduction in the number of forces. And when we look at what they're bringing here, they're bringing pollution, they're bringing crowding, they're bringing traffic, they're bringing damage to our roads, they're bringing pollution to our waters. There's a lot going on that comes with hosting the military. And then on places like Big Island where I live, we have Pohakuloa, which is toxic military training facilities where they release all kinds of nasty things into the environment and we're gonna renew their lease. So I wanna see a more responsible military here that's doing less damage. Uh, let's hear from you uh, on, on this. Do you think that the presence of the, of the US military here in the islands should change? And in what way, if so? You know, first and foremost, I will say this, that the military presence in Hawaii, it's about making sure that this is a mutually beneficial relationship for Hawaii, and for the Department of Defense. That means making sure at the end of the day, it's about how we're all good neighbors, mm -hmm. including uh, those on our military facilities and bases. And when we talk about lease negotiations, many of which are coming up right now in the subject mm -hmm. of you know, a lot of intense discussion, that it is in fact beneficial for the community. It takes into account, and not just takes into account, it really responds to the concerns and the needs of the community and the culture and the natural environment here as well. So I believe the military presence in here can and coexist, we have not done it well in the past and it has to be improved. You know, I would say though that I know there was a question about the economic impact. I do think it creates a unique ecosystem of jobs, non-civilian um, jobs mm. that really benefit our community and can really help to make sure that our children can have jobs, good paying jobs that will be allowed to keep them here. Defense is changing. It really is taking a digital cyber approach as well. Hawaii is still in a strategic location to benefit from this and I wanna see those knowledge-based jobs, those good jobs, really available here for our Kiki to benefit from, to be able to then live and thrive here as well. What are your thoughts? Should the military presence change in Hawaii, and if so, how? Right, well, the military presence is always changing. Throughout our history, we see different issues coming up. We see they have to ramp up to go to the, uh, out in the field in different areas. But when you look seriously at what the military does, one of the issues Michelle talked about, and I've had this discussion many times being up at US Pacific Command, is that <laughs> the, the military gets this thing called a housing allowance. Mm -hmm. And a housing allowance for many military members, and it's oftentimes it's sometimes anywhere between 2,700 up to as high as $4,000 a month. Does that have an effect on our impact in our economy? It does because they have a different availability to buy houses at a higher price than say a normal local person might have, right? Because as an example, I had a friend of mine, he was an 04, which is a major. He had almost $3,600 a month in a housing allowance. Mm -hmm. That was a mortgage plus his electricity plus his part of his food bill that was being covered, not taxed. It's not taxed by anyone. They just get this and they put it into the economy, which is good for, I guess, if you want to say, having equity in a house and you're paying off your house. But when you compare it to a, someone, a local individual here in the state of Hawaii, they don't have it. that person has, if, let's say they make the same base pay after taxes, they make three or four thousand dollars less than this the person that was over there in the military. And, and That's one of them. 
if I could add on this too, you know, I agree, housing has been a big stressor in our right. community. I represented Kanu and Kailu on the Marine Corps base for 12 years in the yeah. state yeah. Senate, and this definitely was a touchy point in terms of overall inventory. That's where we have to, again, when I talk about that mutual re beneficial relationship, really be talking with our military presence about how they're going to help us solve this housing crisis, right. this inventory mm -hmm. crisis that we have. It cannot be about one cannibalizing the other for the benefit of the other. It has to be at how can we look at unique solutions to provide more housing opportunities for both our military men and women as well as our civilians in the surrounding community. We've seen it in other states like Alaska where you can have those mutual beneficial relationships where housing becomes offered to the greater community and mm -hmm. is provided and created by the military for the surrounding community. I think we've got to be smart about that and address those pain points that have exist and really cause that tension oftentimes that we've sensed in the community. Well, and one of the things we can do to resolve that um, essentially is make it a, I'm gonna say a city ordinance where someone coming in, not, not a resident of the state of Hawaii, is not able to buy a property for say two or three years. In other words, you have to be a resident of the state in order to buy a property. If we think about that for a minute, if you have to be here, that means you can't fly in anytime you want to buy a house and fly back out again, pay, let's just say pay $20,000 over the asking price or $100,000 because you have the cash availability. That just drives housing up even higher, right? And it just proves that it, you're gonna have people doing that, coming and spending this money because they can. We've got about 15 minutes left, so I wanna make sure I get to a lot of these questions, including some of the personal stuff that I always like to end on. But let's take on one more issue, and that is the issue of guns. We expect that uh, Congress has you know, talked about this for some time. We've seen some horrific mass shootings, particularly in schools, but also in workplaces and other you know, community spaces where we really shouldn't see firearms and, and just incredible violence. Uh, Joe, do you think there should be new restrictions on guns? <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a proponent for the 2A. We have to understand what it does. The 2A does one thing. It says, it says, to keep and bear arms. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's a constitutional right. Mm -hmm. Does that mean we don't have ba um, basic checks? Of course we do. We have a background check to get a driver's license. Does that mean we don't have one? Of course we do. Would I institute or want to have more background checks, more intrusive and in questioning into whether you can or not? Perhaps we should change that instead of looking at how do we stop good people from owning or being able to defend themselves. Why don't we look at the mental health issues of some of the folks that we've seen having during these mass shootings? Why don't we put money towards those types of programs instead of trying to take away in people's rights to keep and bear arms? Michelle, where do you stand on this? Well, um, historically, from, from the inception of our country, gun ownership has been widespread throughout our country. School shootings, mass shootings, this type of violence has only been coming forward in the last 30 years or so. So to, to say that gun ownership and the right to bear arms leads to these mass shootings and leads to this violence, it doesn't connect. So I think what we really need to figure out is what's causing the popularization of violence, what makes, what makes people famous for being violent, because that's what it really seems these people are trying to chase is, um, you know, fame and notoriety rather than being evil, right? And so they just see this as, how can I get famous quick? Maybe we should stop talking about them and, and, and shun people who behave that way. I, I, I suspect that you have a different take. You, you know, um, just watching the news <laughs> before I showed up here today and you had the Parkland verdict. Um, I know as a mother, as a parent, as a, any, as a mm -hmm. human being, you know, you watch that and your heart breaks. Your heart breaks at the situation that we're seeing all too, too frequent, to the point where it's almost mind-numbing how many school shootings we're experiencing right now. And I do believe that when the forefathers had the Second Amendment in mind, being shot in your school, in your place of worship, in your community center, in a movie theater, in a grocery store, that was not at all what they had in mind when they were creating the Second Amendment. And I think what we've got to do is make sure we've got strong laws at the federal level to make sure that we stop this senseless gun violence. You know, and what we have one of the strongest gun laws in the country to keep our people safe. And I don't think it's any work. coincidences that we don't have as much shootings as you have seen in the mainland. mainland. Thank God for that. We can't take it for granted as well. But I think we have got to make sure that if it's about stopping this senseless, these senseless deaths, these tragedies, we've got to make sure that there are strong laws at the federal level to make sure that people who should never have guns in their hands don't have guns. Joe's talking about responsible people 
you know, having gun own, uh, guns. You know, we have hunters, many hunters in CD2 right now, responsible people who use them in a safe way. The laws we actually have in Hawaii that are extremely strict actually allow for them to bear arms and to utilize it safely, responsibly. But the reality is, absent strong gun laws at the federal level, we will continue to see senseless the issue we have, though, is we actually have like 300,000 gun laws on the books right now. Yeah, I don't, Why do I we don't need think more gun laws? laws? Fix the problem. I think Joe yeah. and I probably agree on this. Gun, making it harder is not going to make it make violence go away. I mean, we had violence before we had guns, you know. So, uh, yeah. We well, let's address the violence part. Maybe make maybe make gun violence have a more increased. Um, you know, like hate crimes have an increased penalty. Maybe there should be an increased penalty for certain types of weapons. Let's take the last few minutes to get to know each of you just a little bit better in, in the short time that we had. So have, if elected, of course, you'd be living in Washington, D.C. for a, a good chunk of the year. What are two or three things that you would most miss about home? <laughs> Let's start with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, rice. No, okay. <laughs> you can get that a lot easier. You know, I'm, I'm thinking okay. back to the days when I went to college and I, I lived in D.C., for four years and well, as well. And they didn't have Amazon and shipping and a lot of other things that we've got now. So definitely, um, you know, the food is something that you miss, but you can definitely create it. I will say personally for me though, um, it's gonna be my family, but that's why I've really committed to make sure that I come home on the weekends, but not only to just see my family and remind myself where my heart is and the urgency with which we fight, but also to make sure that I'm connected and always connected to the district and the people that I wanna serve. We've gotta be present. And remember, the business is not just in DC, the business is here in Hawaii. That's who we're really trying to serve. So definitely, I have to say my family, my boys, my husband, my dog, you know, I think the dog's gonna miss me the most <laughs> out of the household, I'll be honest. The food, and quite frankly, I live on the windward side. And I remember when I was in college, the Ko'olaus, you can't beat that. You can't beat this place that we live in. There's no substitute for it. So the people in the land. Joe, what about you? What are three things that you'd most miss if you had to spend the majority three of things. your times in Washington? Well, I think, I think Jill said it for best is the food. <laughs> um, you know, I've been, been having lived up in um, the Annandale area in DC, which is a, they call it Koreatown. I was so fortunate because I was like, oh, Calby ribs, let's go right down the street. Let's go get some. Um, and that was, that was fun because it's like, right, that's right down the street. And I remember it was Nate one night. I was like, man, I, I'm, I'm jonesing for some Calby ribs. But, you know, I ended up cooking Calby ribs inside of my fireplace. And I got in trouble from the, the, um, the, the landlord. He wasn't happy with that because he had to go clean it all out. Actually, he made me go clean it out. Um, but it was, it was one of those. The food, uh, family. Beaches. I mean, these are these are things that in our in, in our Hawaiian kuleana that this is what you, this is what we miss, right? This is home. And I remember many times having been going out on missions and coming back. I, I would literally would cry when I would come. You know, when the plane makes a turn around Eva and coming into Oahu, you're like, I'm home. I'm home. Yeah. And I think that's the the biggest thing you miss when you're away. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna form new alliances and new friendships and all this other stuff, but home is home. Yeah. Right. Michelle, what about you? What would you miss most? Okay, so I'm going to try to do it fast. I know we're almost done. Um, food is absolute. <laughs> Everyone who knows me, you guys, if you don't know already, I'm a cannabis patient. I was hurt really bad in the military. Everyone who knows me knows that I'm basically shaggy. I have a giant dog. <laughs> I didn't name her Scooby, but she's a big old thing. And um, so food, food, food. Um, the weather, uh, having a lot of medical problems when you get into a lot of cold weather, it can be really difficult on your back. Um, surfing, so I love surfing and I learned to surf in Oahu, which was bad for me and, and great for just the sport, I guess, but when I travel to surf, the water is awful everywhere else. Like Hawaii and Oahu in specific has the nicest, warmest, most comforting water in the ocean I've ever been in. So the water for sure. And I think that that goes well into our last question. We have just a few minutes. So if you could keep your uh, responses to around 30 seconds, you know, this is a very tough job, but a lot of stress. What do you do for stress relief? What is your escape? Well, I'm a cannabis patient. <laughs> I'm a cannabis patient. I don't have stress anymore. Um, so cannabis, surfing, um, I actually get a lot of reward from just helping other people. I'm, I'm one of those very common women that I get an endorphin release from working through problems. So um, for me, just, just trying to get out into nature, surf, uh, and, you know, helping my friends. Yeah. So. And Joe, what about you? Oh, the biggest one. Let's see, golfing, um, paddling, basically outdoors activities, hiking. 
uh, up until the point where I just re-injured my, my meniscus again. So I, I gotta, now I gotta go get that fixed. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, yeah, I enjoy the outdoor life, uh, spending time with um, family, with friends, um, and then also making sure I spend time with my God. Yeah. Right? Give him that benefit, because um, without him, I wouldn't be sitting here today, mm -hmm. so. What do you do to relieve stress? You know, sometimes they can be stressful, but hanging out with my family, my two boys and my husband, you know, um, cooking with my sons, you know, making sure that they'll be able to do that one day on their own, watching K-dramas with my husband, uh, just going grocery shopping. It's the little things that matter the most, but it also reminds you as a servant leader what's important. It's about making sure that every single person in this community feels like you're going to be there as a leader that's going to take care of them like family. And for me, that's the most important thing. And I know you did mention your boys. I mean, you, you have a unique perspective in that you are a, a mom of kids who are still a school age. Mm -hmm. And so how will you figure that out? You know, we're going to figure it out together. But I think for me, it just really rams home the urgency of what we do. It all comes back to all of our children and the fact that the decisions we make today is not about us. It's about them. And if we screw it up, it's gonna be so much harder for them. So for me, I feel very blessed that every night I get to go home or every day I can call them on the phone or video conference with them and remember, we have gotta do the work right and well for them, not for us. Okay, well thank you all for being here tonight. Mahalo to you for joining us. Of course, we do thank our guests, the candidates for U.S. District 2, Republican Joe Akana, Libertarian Michelle Tippins, and Democrat Jill Takuda. Next week on Insights, it could be the tightest race this election as former Judge Richard Bisson takes on incumbent Mike Victorino for the job of Maui County Mayor. Please do join us then. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Until next time, aloha.